we are of course joined by John Harvey. He- hello, John. Hello. Hi. Are you okay there? How are you doing? Um, Obviously, we're living in very strange times. Uh, just sort of ask just how you're coping with the world at, at the moment, the current lockdown. Well, since I've taken voluntary retirement <laughs> from writing, um, it's okay for me at the moment that you know we live near a larger open space Hampstead Heath I can go out early in the morning and avoid people and do uh, an hour's walk and then the rest of the day you know I'm I'm indoors I'm doing a lot of reading um, certain amount of blogging and so on and just keeping myself busy Brilliant. So you've been a professional writer now for maybe for around 40, 45 years, and you've been credited with writing over 100 books, which is an, an, a huge amount of books. Uh, and obviously, those books, uh, they're not all crime, which is what you're most famous for. Uh, but I was just sort of wondering if you're able to let us know how you came to writing, and sort of maybe uh, what you first wrote, and how you actually arrived at writing crime novels, how crime became your, uh, your thing. Well. Crime became my thing kind of almost accidentally um, and after I'd done quite a lot of writing. um, There are a hundred novels under my name, well actually under my name and a lot of pseudonyms as you say, but what what you'd have to realise is that probably the first 50 or 60 of those are relatively short um, pulp fiction books, um, westerns, Hell's Angels, um crime novels war novels all kinds of things um the only thing that distinguishes them is they're all 128 pages and 50,000 words long the first four or five years i probably wrote 12 or 13 books a year wow. so that's roughly you know one a month or thereabouts but as i say we're talking we're talking relatively short books and books which were very formulaic and therefore you know not not the most difficult book to read, to write, rather. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, so roughly you're saying the book like that took maybe three, four weeks to write from start to finish. And then, so what would the difference be yeah. between writing, say, a book like that and writing, say, a Resnick or a Frank Elder book? Uh, what kind of... Uh, uh, what, what, oh, the, well, the, di- the difference... Yeah, the difference, is, the difference is quite enormous, really. Um, So when I got to write the very first Resnick book, Lonely Hearts, um, that was the first time I'd ever had as long, say, as a year to write a book as opposed to a month. So apart from the book being longer, um, it did mean that I could spend much more time over the book. I could think more about the characterization. I could try and be a bit more original in the story. Um, I could go back over passages and, and sentences and rewrite them, which if you're writing a book a month, you don't have much time to rewrite. You just yeah. bang it down onto the page and send it off to the publisher. So when you've got, when I had a year to write a book, I mean, to me, that was an absolute luxury. And I could actually think more about the language and what I was doing with the language, think about the characters and how I might develop them through more than one book, possibly. Um, yeah, as I say, it was just a luxury after having written a number of books very quickly. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, I mean, to have that, that extra luxury, as you say, must have been fantastic. And, you know, to go from, as you say, just writing down bish, bash, bosh, to be able to really develop it must have been really incredible. I mean, so did the quick novels, uh, the earlier novels, uh, or the westerns and so on, uh, to, uh, would you say that was good training for moving on to that? Kind of absolutely absolutely it was it was it was like being paid to practice yeah you know it's like it's like it's like any skill chris if you if you want to if you want to develop a skill you use it you know you want to learn to play the piano you play the piano if you want to learn to mend sinks and you know be a plumber you get on with it and get down on your hands and knees under the sink and work at it wow. and the great thing about doing that much writing was yeah that i was I was honing whatever skill craft you want to call it. So by the time I came to write Lonely Hearts, um, I had, yeah, I, I had a lot of the tools that I needed to write a longer and hopefully a better book. 
superb. And um, why was it that you actually chose a crime novel as, you know, uh, Lonely Hearts? Why was it crime that you chose to write with it? Um, I, do you know, I, when I was writing the pulp novels, I did write four crime novels about a private eye called Scott Mitchell. Um, and they're pretty terrible. <laughs> they're, not, they're not the greatest books in the world. Um, and I thought, yeah, because they were they were okay, and I thought I I thought crime fiction wasn't my thing, because those hadn't worked particularly well. But then I suppose before I wrote Lonely Hearts for a couple of years, I was reading quite a lot of crime fiction. I read a lot of Elmore Leonard, for instance. And although my work, I don't think is anything like Elmore Leonard, because he's a lot funnier than I have. Um, it it encouraged me to think more about crime fiction again. Yeah. Um, and the other reason, Chris, was this, that the year before I started working on Lonely Hearts, um, I wrote a, a series for Central Television um, about the probation service called yeah. Hard Cases, which was filmed in Nottingham. Um, had a theme song by Tom Robinson, which some people say was the best thing about it. Um, <laughs> so I'd had that experience of writing in some detail about things happening in the city yeah um so what i wanted to do was to find a way of writing a novel about nottingham hopefully realistic about nottingham and the people in it and i thought maybe the best way to do that was to have um, a police detective as the kind of central figure who would take you through the story take you through the streets of nottingham if you like yeah no, I think that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. I mean, you uh, say you chose Nottingham as the sort of the, 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 the base, the home for, uh, for your novel. I mean, uh, was it, I was choosing Nottingham because you lived there or was it? I was living there. Yeah, I was living there at the time. Um, I came to Nottingham first in the, what, the mid seventies, I suppose. Um, and I was teaching not in Nottingham, but out in Hena. Yeah. Um, I spent several years teaching out there and then I came back to Nottingham to do uh, an MA in the American Studies Department at the university and just hung around because, you know, it's a great place to be <laughs> and really liked it as a city. And I thought um, it would be a good setting uh, for two reasons, really. Partly because although there's a lot going on in Nottingham, it's not so huge mm. that you can't, you know, help to hope to encompass it in a novel. And the other reason was, at the time, I don't think there were any other crime novels set in Nottingham. You had a lot of great novels like, you know, Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, etc., etc., um, and all the way back to D.X. Lawrence and so on. But you, there weren't any crime novels there. And so that was, the, I thought, okay, this is, you know, these are good reasons for trying to set this here. Yeah, I mean, uh, setting a, a novel or a series in a place that you live, does that put any extra pressure on you? Because obviously you're going to bump into people who know the area, they, they know you. <laughs> yeah, not, not really. I mean, um, at first I was kind of careful to change the names of, of, of one or two places. I, I changed the name of a couple of pubs, for instance, and so on. But, but there didn't seem to be much point to doing that. And, and in fact, um, people in Nottingham then and now have, have always been very positive about the Resnick books, you know. Um, so, uh, it, no, it, it hasn't been a problem, I don't think. I mean, I think, you know, there are other writers like, say, John McGregor, for instance, who have set novels in Nottingham. And I think he'd probably say the same thing, that you're, you're welcome, you know, and if you're, not, if you're kind of dissing the place and making it sound terrible, then you yeah. won't be so but, uh, No, no, you definitely say people... You know, there's a real warmth towards you know towards your novels. You know, you know, I, I see in our libraries. You know, so it's it's, it's a great thing to see. Uh, I mean, talking a little bit more about Charlie Resnick. Uh, just think about anyone who's maybe watching this interview who maybe hasn't read any of the Resnick novels before. Brian, would you say that you 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 are? Well, the, the Resnick. I suppose the Resnick novels and the Elder novels are a little bit different. In the Resnick novels, are definitely what would be called police procedurals. I suppose you know, in the same way that say Ian Rankin's books or Peter Robinson's books of police procedurals. So um, there's always a, a police investigation at the, at the center of them and Resnick is always at the center of that investigation. You've usually got a kind of rolling group of, of characters who work with him. Um, 
the crimes themselves, you know, tend to vary from book to book, but the, so the, the things that are constant, apart from the picture of the city itself, is, are the portraits of Resnick himself and how he develops, how he ages, relationships he fails to have <laughs> successfully and so on. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that just from talking to people about the books over the years, it's somehow, it's Resnick's character that, that people hone in on um, they find they find him a very sympathetic um, character, which I think he probably is. Um, and I, th I think he's he's the kind of heart of the books. And I think if people do read the series, that's that's what they you know that's why they're reading them. I had an email recently from somebody who said, with all of the lockdown, current lockdown going on, she'd gone back to reread um, yeah. the Resnick series from the beginning. And she said, um, what a great comfort it was to have Charlie back in her life. Um, and I think people who read the books do kind of think of him as, I mean, they know he's not real, but they think of him as, as, as an actual presence, you know? Yeah. No, I think that's really, it's interesting you say that you had an, e an email from uh, a, a lady saying that she'd gone back to read in you know the uh, the whole series from the you know from the beginning. I think from talking to people, there seems to be a lot of that out at the moment. People are going back to reading books they've read previously is sort of quite yes, nice. Well, I think it's partly because they can't they can't go out and buy new ones. Right, yeah, it's, it's more <laughs> difficult to go out and buy new ones. So um... no, it's probably, it's probably a fair point. So, <laughs> uh, so I mean, to you, you said the Resnick book were a little bit different to the Elder book. The, uh, how would you classify the difference in the uh, the uh, well i mean elder was a policeman he isn't any longer so in that sense um it's it's the central character there the person who's doing the detecting if you like yeah. um is is working as a as a solo person he doesn't have the kind of backup of a police force with him um yeah. i suppose they're more they probably be classed more as thrillers than police procedurals um, they're often about, you know, somebody in the first book, it's the first and the last book of the Elder series, it's, um, it's Elder's daughter, who's a teenager in the first book, Flesh and Blood, and a young woman of 23 or so in the, in the fourth book, Body and Soul. And so the heart of those books is the relationship between Elder and his daughter, which is prickly. Um, anybody watching or listening to this who's got a teenage daughter will recognize the possibility of prickly relationships um so that's the kind of heart of those of those books uh, as opposed to you know resnick in the, in the other books so looking about how you go about writing your book uh, when you're writing you know a uh, you know one of your murder mystery you know when your crime books uh, uh when you set out do you know who's going to commit the, the uh, crime when you first start or does it come to halfway through or you get to the end and go that person would be better to commit a crime or so it, it, it's a it, it's a bit like that i mean i i occasionally i would know but usually especially in the resume books i don't know and i think what i would always try and do with the story is to have four or five um possible murderers criminals whatever all yeah. of them having reasonable access to the crime all of them having some kind of motivation so as Resnick goes through the investigation asking questions finding out about these people um, more or less at the same time as he's um, finding out motivation possibility and so on I'm doing the same in the writing I mean I'm slightly ahead of him usually um, but then maybe by the time I get two thirds of the way through the book, I then feel I've got to make a decision. Yeah. So at that point, I'll decide, OK, he did it or she did it. And then you maybe have to go back through the book and make a few changes just to make sure um, that that person is, you know, is the possible kind of villain of the piece. Uh, I, think, I think if I knew exactly from the beginning too much of the plot it wouldn't be as interesting to write i mean one of the interesting things as a writer is just 
how the story you know develops yeah um, in a way that can take you by surprise sometimes that's what makes it's quite interesting because i mean uh, i think what you said there is something that a lot of authors say and i always sort of and i've, I've sort of probably one of the best ways i've heard it explained actually because some, sometimes people say oh i'll just find someone else and think oh the amount of rewriting you have must, you must have to do go back but you say you've got like a cast of four or five people who you feel are plausible murderers i think that yes. makes quite a lot of sense whereas that's probably the best way i've heard it explained sometimes I think oh goodness if then you've got to go back and rewrite the whole thing but i guess as a writer you must have a lot of patience to rewrite and and having to do that kind of thing well do you know i actually really like a, like quite a few writers i've spoken to i actually really love rewriting mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think there's something really, yeah, there's something really enjoyable about going over the work and not simply ironing out implausibilities in the plot, yeah. <laughs> but, but actually going over sentences, you know, just getting the feel of the sentence right. Um, saying it in your head, maybe sometimes saying it out loud, just to kind of get the rhythm of the sentence and the rhythm of the paragraph right. And it's really nice to, ha to have the time to go back and do that. Um, so I, th I think rewriting is a really kind of enjoyable part of the, what a writer does. Yeah. So, I mean, if you write a book, uh, what sort of percentage is rewriting? So getting the first draft, is that the majority of your time or is the majority of the time actually washing it up, so to speak? Yeah, it's difficult to say because I'm re on one hand, I'm rewriting all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then at the end, there would there might depending on what my editor says, there might be a kind of ma a more major rewrite. Yeah. Um, so to d to think about it as a percentage is 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 difficult. Yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> so I think it's, it's well, it's a fairly constant process. I mean, I probably at the end of the day, I might read through what I wrote that morning. Then the next morning, I'll start work by reading through what I wrote the day before. Yeah. and maybe make you know small changes then then when i get to the end of say two or three chapters i'll read that as a section and make changes so that's a constant process but then of course when my when my editor gets her hands on it um she will send a very detailed list of suggestions i mean anything from something as small as wouldn't this be better as a semicolon yeah. And that's a great thing for me because I love semicolons. Um, you know, to saying, well, if we changed this part of the story and moved it four or five chapters back, maybe that would increase the tension. So I get very, I've had this, been lucky enough to have the same editor for a number of years now. Oh, and good. the amount of feedback I get is, is, is really valuable. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. It's just interesting to see how it's, uh, 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 you know, sort of how it's done, really. Uh, I mean, I'm just going to divert away from crime for a second. I just wanted to uh, have a quick chat about, some, about one of the other sort of careers, really. I mean, as I said in the introduction, you know, you're a, you're a script writer, publisher, musician, but you've also got quite a big career in, uh, in, in poetry, which you've uh, been doing a little bit more of uh, recently. And you had a book out last year called Aslan. Uh, Aslan. Which you, were, uh, which you came up to inspire and, and uh, said of as, uh, as part of the Inspire Poetry Festival last, uh, last year. Uh, as I think that's your most recent book out, I wonder if you might be able to tell us a little bit of us about, us about that, that book, what inspired you to write it, why you wrote it, uh, just that really. Yeah, well, A Slant, um, it's, not, it's not wholly in my book. It's, uh, it's a book of my poems and my younger daughter's photographs. Um, Molly Ernestine Boiling, by name, who's um, just finishing her third year at the University of Nottingham um, studying history of art and history, although, of course, she's not actually at the university now. She's back home getting lectures online. <laughs> um, but Molly's been a keen photographer for a number of years now, from when she was you know, quite young. So the book is a mixture of her photographs and my poems we gave it the title A Slant, um, partly because her photographs kind of look at things from odd angles and strange angles, many of them. So a slant in that sense. And hopefully some of the poems uh, of mine that are in the book, again, look at situations from a slightly unusual point of view. Yeah. So if anything links the poems and the photographs, that's 
that was it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's and what I ended up with, it, it was published, um, you know, in Nottingham and um, really, it's a really beautiful looking book. So yes, I've got a copy of it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's one of the nicest looking books that I've, I've had and both Molly and I were really proud of, of the way it the way it looked yes i have actually the one last book um the more recent book that was published um is uh which is quite recent is a book primarily for um teenage readers uh, okay. called blue watch yeah and it's set during the uh, during the blitz in london um okay. my dad was a fireman mm -hmm. all during the uh, second world war and um, I'd wanted for a long time to kind of write something about that, but had never really kind of found a way of doing it. But then um, originally from my French publisher, I was asked to write something, a, a kind of adventure story um, for teenage uh, readers. And um, so then I decided that to try and set something during the, during the Blitz, um, hence, you know, Blue Watch. So Blue Watch and a Slant, um, and the last elder book, Body and Soul, they're the last three books, yeah. um, all of which, thank heavens, I'm pretty happy with. It would be, <laughs> it would be bad thing to, to think you'd stopped writing at the point where you'd gone hit downhill. So hopefully I've got to the top of the hill and yeah. uh, those are the books I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy to uh, yeah, be known by. No, no, great. Uh, so, uh, so, do you have anything else that, uh, that you're working on at, at present? Or? No, I'm, I'm, I'm happily not writing anything. The nearest I've got to writing is um, very occasional tweets, um, which are, uh, how am I describing them? Sentences from a novel that's never going to be written. Um, <laughs> But, but no, I mean, I'm just writing stuff on my blog occasionally and, you know, keeping in touch with people. But, but uh, I don't have any plans to, to write anything, uh, anything else, really. Fair, uh, fair, uh, fair play. So, uh, obviously, with it being a, you know, a bit of a crime news month, I just thought I'd ask you a few questions now about maybe your favourite crime novels, things that you like, crime books you like to read, that kind of stuff, if that's OK. Hmm. Uh, Who's your favourite crime? Uh, basically, who is your favourite? Uh, who is your favourite uh, crime writer, other than yourself? <laughs> um, well, he's better than me. Um, my favourite crime writer is an Australian writer called Peter Temple, who sadly died a couple of years ago, um, much too soon. Um, his his last two novels, um, The Broken Shore and Truth, um, to me are you know two of the best crime novels I know full stop um, and novels that I I don't tire of reading I mean in fact I reread them both earlier this year and that's probably the fourth or fifth time I've read them oh, and right. it's because to me he he manages the kind of perfect combination of a strong story that is kind of sociologically and politically aware yeah conscious about the, the world in which he's writing about and the um, kind of corruption of the world and, and, that he's writing about and so on but who also is a beautiful writer of prose so when I'm rereading it I know sometimes I'm looking forward to that section in chapter two where such and such happens because I know he describes it so well um, you know so I love his use of language and I admire the way in which you know, he writes about um, Australian society, the books are set in and around Melbourne, and you know, manages to convey what seems to me a very real sense of, of, of life as it's, as it's lived. Yeah. So yeah, he's my, he's my main man. There are others um, that, that I like um, and, and reread also, but, but Peter Temple is, is the guy. Yeah, I mean, you probably just read uh, the sunset. So, I mean, do you have a favourite crime book as, as well? Because I mean, obviously, Peter Temple, but is it a Peter Temple book your favourite, or do you have another book which is your real favourite crime book? Well, no, I I I'd hate to be repetitive. Um, I think <laughs> no, I know I don't really. Um, I think those two, um, I would say, are my my favourite crime books: um, The Broken Shore and Truth. Another book that I I really admire. 
um, by an English writer called Bill James, who's yeah. written for a long time, um, maybe not as well known as he should be. Uh, yeah, one, of, one of his novels called Roses, Roses, which I think he probably wrote 12 years ago now, is yeah. also a ki is kind of perfection to me. Um, it's a really, 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 it's tight, it's funny, um, it's just a smashing book. And so uh, that, that's another real favourite and something I go back to. Um, writer called James Crumley wrote a superb private eye novel called The Last Good Kiss. Yeah. It would have to be good, right? So it's a great title. Um, <laughs> it's great that's, another, that's another book to go back to um, and which I'd, I'd recommend to people who like, if you like private eye books, American private eye books, that would be very good. Um, okay. You know, there are so many. Michael Connolly's Bosch um series um i i like and, and reread yeah brilliant no i, I, I you know just just seeing my uh, hand moving to the side that i was writing down some some suggestions for my reading <laughs> my future reading, so. uh, i mean and just one other question uh what is your favorite tv series or film which is based on a crime novel did you have a oh my god that... you can choose resnick because obviously that was <laughs> the tv series um okay well because i'm I mean, you know, there are things like series like The Wire, which were absolutely kind of, you know, mind blowing at the time, which really opened up different possibilities for writing about crime and writing about society in a, in a different way. Um, going back a little, Hill Street Blues um, was a wonderful series, absolutely very influential on the series I wrote, Hard Cases, set in Nottingham about the probation service, yeah. because um, the great thing about Hill Street Blues, apart from being funny and having good characters, is ha how many storylines they packed into a single episode. Yeah. So before I wrote the first episode of Hard Cases, which also was going to have multiple storylines, I went through episodes of Hill Street Blues with a stopwatch. Wow. And I wrote down how many minutes and seconds there were for this storyline, how many for that, how many of the scenes. And then when I wrote the first script, I did it exactly, or more or less exactly, according to the breakdown of scenes in Hill Street Blues, just copying that structure. Um, so Hill Street Blues is great. And more recently, and I'm re-watching these at the moment, um, the Swedish Philander series. With Christian Hendrickson um, as as uh, Valanda, based on the books by Henning Mankell, yeah. um, I think uh, as a, a really intelligent, interesting, well plotted, um, again great characterisation, and through the whole series you see um, Valanda as a character slowly getting older and older, being wary of his health, until in the last few episodes, you realise he's beginning to suffer from dementia. Yeah. And the way the actor plays that and the way it's written is so wonderfully convincing. Yeah. And there's a chilling moment, Chris, when you, you realise he's been kind of forgetting things in the yeah. way that we elderly people always do. Um, but then there's one moment where he opens his wardrobe at home and you realise there are all these post-it notes stuck on the back of the wardrobe of the names of people that he works with every day Ooh. just to remind him of who they are. Yeah. And honestly, it's, it's, it's just wonderful. It is one of those great things. What cr good crime fiction does... It enables you, as well as telling a, a good compulsive story, to really go into people's characters um, and to really go into, you know, social situations. Um, it's, a, it's a blessing for a, for a writer to have that kind of framework to be able to work in, I think. Yeah, no, it's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, well, go on, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, just be, uh, a bit, I'll just be a bit selfish now. Could you recommend a, a book to me to read? <laughs> a book you can recommend me to read? Um, yes, I'd recommend a book that isn't a crime novel, yeah. shall I? Um, Please do, yeah. I've just been, I'm doing a lot of rereading, you see, because, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's what people are doing at the moment. Me um, too, yeah. And um, 
there's a, an American novelist, died a few years ago, not terribly well known, called Kent Haruf. That's spelt H-A-R-U-F. Yeah. And I think he only wrote four novels. Um, the best of the four is called Plain Song. Um, they're set in a small um, rural community in the States. Yeah. They, the writing is beautiful. It's, it's very stripped down, mm -hmm. and yet it's very evocative at the same time. And without seeming to try and, without seeming to want that effect, he reduces you to tears. Um, it's it's one of those great pieces of writing that's really hard edged, and yet there's a suppleness to it that means it can be very emotional at the same time. So if you haven't read Kent Haru, oh, I've not, no, I've, I've he's your man. <laughs> he's your man. Honestly, he's he's great. He's great, and there are only four of them, so it needn't take you too long. They're all quite short. <laughs> no, it's brilliant to say. It's always lovely to uh, get extra recommendations of what you know, because you, particularly at uh, present, so much like you say, I am going back over and reading books. I suppose that uh, I know are going to make me happy. So right. It's gonna, <laughs> so, and also, I guess because I'm stuck in the house a lot with you know the working. Yeah. So, but it's, it's, I'm going back to things that I know. I'm going back to. I've been reading. A, a series of uh, five books uh, that I read. I think the last time I read was about I was about fifteen or something. So some Len Dayton ones, which I loved at the time. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, what are they like? Building they games that up? much, and I still quite enjoy them. But I, it's not it's not quite it's not quite the same. But I remember reading them twenty twenty five years ago, and I remember I bought the first one from a second hand bookshop, and then I went back to the same bookshop, and they didn't have them there. I remember running down to the library. And trying to get one and I'm, yeah so I'm, I'm I'm it's not quite as good I'm really enjoying going back there and remembering that kind of time when I was there so yeah it's been lovely I mean I think we were probably coming towards the end there anyway okay. and anyway uh what I wanted want to say was thank you ever so much for joining us for this interview today with him uh, with not at all it's been uh, a pleasure a pleasure for me too. I've got some book recommendations, which is fantastic. I can now go and try and uh, try and get those from the uh, from Inspire. We've, we've got our old or ebook. So I'll try and find some of those there and see if I can download those. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much and keep safe, John. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye, Chris. Thank you.